continue with Professor Zikat Turk from uh, University of Ljubljana. <coughs> you will need a presentation to Yes. Um, or with some more accessible yes. technology. Mm -hmm. On the floor, you're talking about disinformation as a political weapon. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the um, invitation. I will speak about disinformation in general, so not so much disinformation in international relations, not so much about disinformation as a tool of war, uh, but disinformation as a political weapon in mostly what are domestic policies. And what I will be trying to say is, yes, disinformation is a political weapon. It was and it will be in the future. Nothing new about that. Um, what I will try to say is that it's not so much about disinformation, that disinformation is just one of the tools from the toolbox of a wider effort, which is called influence operations, which is probably part of the hybrid warfare. Um, what is new is that internet changed a few things, but my claim is counter-narrative that disinformation, fake news, and all this panic that we have been living in <coughs> since 2016 is not such a major issue as some would like us to believe, and they have good reasons why they would like us to believe that. It is one of the tools of influence operations, not the most powerful ones. Influence operations are about trust, and it is trust, not truth. The difference between information and disinformation is whether it's true or not. It is trust versus not trusting. That is the focus of influence operations. Um, and you could do it in truthful means as well. And I would conclude that, yes, disinformation can be stopped. There is technology out there. There are some legal means to do that. Um, but may it be, can we do it? Would that be aligned with our democratic principles? Or what measures would be aligned with our democratic principles? And of course, influence operations which um, state actors, political parties uh, want to engage in and be successful with, influence operations can be successful without this information, without payment. Um, let's Let's, let's begin with what has actually changed. Why is the current communication and media environment different than it was before? Let's look at the news or the information process or how things happen. I thought that I will be able to handle this and no matter where you point, it doesn't work. So, Professor, <laughs> you, have a, you have a sincere problem. It wasn't you. Um, so, so how it happens? You create a new story, um, then you quality control it with, with some editors, with some, with some uh, proofreading, uh, you publish it, um, you then amplify it, you put it at the top of the newsstand where people start talking about it, or you create advertising about it, um, and then somebody consumes that news. This is what, what is happening. Um, and the if you look, do this schematically. Um, that would not be so stupid, but okay. It's not now. I have the, the other hand. So the traditional news process would uh, go from left to right. You have you would create the information here in the on the left hand side of this slide in, in this area, and then you you would have this part, which the editors, the journalists, the political parties, and the politicians like very much, because you would control the whole process through the edit, edit, publish, amplify uh, kind of stage. Uh, and in the traditional news process, the editing would be concentrated, the publishing would be concentrated, the amplification would be more or less concentrated, and then you would have the consumers, of course, consume that news. 
Um, and if you would control this process here, you would basically control your media environment. And on the internet, as people in this room are tweeting and blogging about this event, anyone can publish, anyone can amplify, anyone can like, anyone can boost uh, uh, the news and the information, anyone can edit it, quality control it. Uh, editors are gone. In that last key, there was no trash can. You could say internet is one huge trash can of information. There's no difference between <laughs> trash and non-trash. Um, so, no more gatekeepers. There is a huge kind of chaos in the middle of it. And the key issue of the fight against fake news, the fight against disinformation is, can we, from this chaotic picture here, would it be possible to go back to this? This is beautiful, this is what we control. This is what we can take the grip of. And here we are par powerless. Can we get back to the previous one? And, well, there are ways to do it. But what I will argue in the next few slides is that the problem is actually not as bad as we are led to believe. Probably uh, you heard this story that, and the research, that, that these are solid figures, it's just a matter, a matter of interpretation. Um, that actually the social media is the main driver of this information of fake news. Uh, you would read statistics that 10% of the readers of top news come to top news sites, come to CNN, come to Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung through social media. But 40% of the traffic into the fake news sites come from social media. 10% here, 40% there. Social media is really, really bad. But if you put that into the perspective of the size of the audience, the two charts, how much top news are people reading and how much disinformation are people reading, on this chart it is drawn uh, in, 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 in scale. There's actually still a lot of people who read top news and rather few people who talk and uh, follow the so-called disinformation. Indeed, fake and real news are discussed a lot. Fake news, disinformation is discussed a lot. It is discussed as much as real news on the social media sites. This may be scary, but actually how much people are consuming and reading disinformation versus information is still very much favorable to um, real information. And in Europe, it's even better. It's an interesting take out that um, Europeans seem to be much more resilient to disinformation than the Americans. In Europe, the discussion, on, even on social media, about a particular, around a particular election, was six to one in favor of real news, while in the US was one on one, the discussions about fake and real news were Equal, equally, equally presented. And, and this difference, by the way, uh, is replicated in many, many different European elections that took place over the last year. For example, in the French elections, it was 10 to 1. Discussions on, on French social media in the last French elections, 10 times as much discussion about real news than about disinformation. The actual audience size, um, real news size, readership on the left hand side of the screen and then the long tail of the disinformation sites on the right hand side. So people still read a lot of the real news and you have there under the fake ones also some Sputniks and those who you would who you would call as, as foreign uh, uh, information operations. So it's um, reach of fake news is about 10% of the reach of the real news. If you want to have somebody to blame, and if you want to have the bad guy in this uh, disinformation discussion and about the spread of the disinformation, uh, then this would be Facebook. 
So most of the traffic into these disinformation sites and, in, in, uh, and into fake news is coming from Facebook. This is statistic just about one of the, of the fake news, but this is not the major problem that we have with um, social media sites. I think a lot of people here on Facebook, if you're not on Facebook, you may be on Twitter, you may be on LinkedIn, so you are on one of these sites that offer you a stream of events that you should be interested in. So, um, typical Facebook page uh, over there. And the interesting and the dangerous and the scary part is that Facebook is deciding which 10% of all the news do you see. We see 10% of what our friends and what people that we follow and that people that we like have published. We see 10%. We have time for 10%. Facebook decides which 10%. Not Russia. Not the Macedonian uh, uh, hackers. Facebook. Um, when Facebook chose to remove news from feed, it was hurting 10% of the real news traffic, it was hurting 40% of the fake news traffic, but uh, both were unhappy um, about this. How Facebook decides this 10%, it's not entirely clear. It's actually good that it's not entirely clear because then hacking Facebook, then writing news in such a way that they would come up to the top of your stream on Facebook would be even easier. So we don't exactly know how this is happening, the algorithm is changing, there are uh, people who will be complaining that it is hostile to them. For example, the, the right wing, uh, wing um, politicians, parties, publishers in the US have been complaining that the last change of Facebook was affecting, you see, uh, down there, uh, the right wing sites were, were very much affected and the liberal and the neutral ones not so much. So it can be a constant kind of <coughs> mistrust, distrust into what people see on the, on the internet. And this is the key impact, the key factor that Facebook and similar sites have on the world. They decide, they choose the 10%. And this is, I think, when we, we speak about information warfare, about influence operations, uh, about fake news, disinformation, etc. This is the elephant in the room. This is the big story. Who decides what you look at? Is he or she or is that company deciding it in a neutral and an impartial way or are they trying to follow somebody's agenda? And I'm not saying Facebook is following anybody's agenda. They are being blamed that they were helping Trump, but they were just plagued. Their algorithms were plagued by everybody, including uh, including the Trump campaign. Some disinformation about this information. Um, yes, it is a weapon. Yes, this information is a political weapon. But according to several studies, and I know that it is much more popular nowadays to say that it's a big problem, that it's a bigger problem. But there are studies in peer-reviewed scientific journals that would tell you that this information was affecting the election results, this is a quote from the study of elections in the US, by an order of a hundredth of a percentage point. And you have to read the whole paper how they, how they came up to, the, um, to this, uh, to this uh, conclusion, but the, the, the citation is there. The, uh, the, um, the sources is there. <coughs> is this information a political weapon? Of course, this information is a political <coughs> weapon. Political language, and this is a quote from George Orwell, political language is designed to make lies sound truthful. Lies sound truthful. This is fake news. This is the, the very definition of this information. Murder respectable and to give an appearance of solidity to pure, to pure wind. This is political language, this is business as usual, there are just new um, technologies out there. And people say, oh, but if only people knew, if only they knew the truth about the consequences of Brexit, if they, people only knew the truth about Donald Trump, 
if people only knew the truth about these stupid social democratic policies, if people only knew the truth about these stupid Christian democratic policies, they would not vote for, for any of that. I think that's a fallacy. This is, this is not true. They would, I think they would, still, um, they would still vote the same, and the actual consequence of this information and fake news is what in the end remains, what in the end people remember is, is, is very small. This is a, a chart from the same paper I quoted already, and they were asking how much people trust this information, how much people remember this information. And this is major news, big stories in this uh, first, col first two columns, second two columns, minor local news, and then you have fake and placebo news. So the researchers invented news that never existed. They were never part of the news stream. Asked Americans, so do you, do you believe that? Do you remember that news? Do you believe that news? And they remembered placebo news. About as much as fake news, about as much as disinformation. So this gives you a perspective of how strong, of how strong an impact disinformation really has. However, um, why there is such a huge fuss about disinformation, fake news, the internet, the internet destroying the media, the internet destroying policy, the internet destroying democracy. Because in the old system, in the old media system, you would have old media, old political parties, they would work together. You would have uh, the chief editor of some right-leaning newspaper who would work very closely with the right-leaning political parties, editor-in-chief of a left-leaning newspaper would be working closely together with the left-leaning parties, and they would have this happy, I would say a monopoly, but they would have carved the media space and they would have carved the um, the political space for themselves. There was no competition. They were controlling the competition. They were controlling the uh, media environment. <coughs> now that there is the internet, you have new media, you have new political parties. But the old players are very much interested in trying to suppress that competition, both political competition as well as uh, media competition. and. They have created and amplified this narrative of fake news, of disinformation, of hate speech, etc. All in order to bring back, if you remember those two schemes of news dissemination, into that old picture where there is no more chaos, where you can control what is happening uh, in the center. So, a lot of it, a lot of the discussion, I'm not saying everything, but a lot of the discussion about disinformation and fake news is to find a scapegoat. To find a scapegoat, why did we lose Brexit? Why did Hillary Clinton lose? Um, why are we losing to populists? It's very convenient to say, oh, the butler did it, or the, the internet did it, or the fake news did it, the Russians did it. It is so much more, it is so much easier than saying, well, maybe we did not have the best candidate. Maybe we, we got some messages wrong. Maybe the other guys were better. Um, so, stopping, stopping this discussion about disinformation, let's, let me briefly conclu conclude with the uh, topic of influence operation, which is the big, interesting, um, important, uh, important topic. What are influence operations? These are operations that trick the audience into believing stuff that they would not believe otherwise, in order that they would change decision to vote, that they would vote differently, in order that they would regret how they voted um, and to undermine the trust in the whoever was elected. This is, the, this is what you want to achieve with the influence operations. And truth is actually not a very big part of the story. The influence operation with respect to the election of Donald Trump was a success. We just don't know whether it was the Republican influence operation that actually swing the votes towards Donald Trump, or was it the Democratic uh, influence operation which claims that Donald Trump has been elected, well, after cheating and, we would say, illegally, but almost uh, after, after Russian collusion, etc. 
The result is um, that the administration has been taken away some of its legitimacy. It's not the position of Donald Trump. It's not the same as if he would win the election fairly. And I'm not claiming that he did not win fairly. But this is the end result. And the Russians can be very happy about it. Because in the end, it is them who benefit. If you, if you have been uh, observing how the Russians denied that they were involved in the US elections, they were not denying, you know, really strongly and re really emphatically. Because by that, they would empower the political position of Trump. They were kind of pro forma denying them now. No, no, we didn't do it. To leave some doubt, because they want Trump weak. There are many, yes. Uh, there are more, uh, there's more than one way to treat people. Um, it became, yes, because of the internet, more complicated than having partisan editors in the mainstream media. Um, messaging based on facts does not resonate with real people. We are in this room, people with, with us facts resonate. With the voters, they want emotion, they want, they want something different. Um, satire, humor, memes are just as effective as disinformation. And we will be seeing, and we are seeing now, if you observe the US election campaign, how much is invested in humor, how much is invested in kind of political show business. Um, not many lies circul circul circling around. Not many fake news, not many disinformation. Just fun stuff designed to, to trick voters. The control of the narrative is the key in today's political warfare. Set the agenda, control the news cycle. How the problem is, is, is framed. Trust matters. You need authentic candidates, you need authentic communication. Um, and you can do stuff that political parties can do legitimately what bots and the Russians are accused of, and that is amplifying messages. <coughs> Real people can go on the internet and like stuff by the politicians that they like. Real people can engage in uh, discussions on the internet, uh, etc. And the good stuff that the social media networks are doing is that, uh, that they are really trying to create a difference between what is, who are the real users and what are some algorithms pretending to be real users. So let me conclude. In my view, this information is a weak political tool. It's a weak political tool. Truth is available about all the fake news news. Truth was out there. If people wanted to search for truth, they could find truth. There's no better tool to find the truth as is the internet. There's also no better tool to find lies as is the internet. But if people do not seek for truth, that points to some other issues and some other problems which serious politicians should look into. Um, stopping this information will not stop populists, will not stop populism, but listening to the problems, the grievances that the populists are exploiting with. And probably a very important point, censorship undermines trust as well. Imagine if you have elections and widespread complaints after that election, what kind of sites, what kind of people, what kind of voices were suppressed before that election. Legitimacy of those elections would be undermined, and of course the power, the, the legitimacy of the political leadership elected in those elections would be undermined. So it's, uh, one has to be very, very careful with uh, what one does in trying to suppress this information and trying to suppress um, fake news. Technologically, you could do many things to, to get the good stuff on the internet. The most democratic one is that you install filter. You, as a user, you install a filter on a browser, and it will tell you what is fake and what is not. It will not be the government doing it for you. It will not be Facebook doing it for you. You will choose it to put it on the browser, and you will have the um, uh, you will have the evaluation of everything that you browse. They are not so democratic tools. Governments can interfere. But they can't because there are laws about freedom of expression and non-interference of government, so the hands are tied. And what is happening, I think, very dangerous, very dangerously, is that gatekeeping, that chart with, with that cloud that it was out of control, this gatekeeping is being outsourced to the big socialists, being outsourced to Facebooks, Googles, Twitters, 
Apple's, Amazon's of this world. Politicians are giving huge power to companies who are already extremely powerful, hoping that these companies will well, help them win elections or at least uh, uh, prevent others from, uh, from, from uh, taking the victory uh, from them. Well, I think you do not want democracy in the hands of, for example, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, you know this one, should we do it? Should we do censorship? What do conventions say? Um, they guarantee free speech and freedom of expression and non-interference of the government. If there's one thought I would like you um, to conclude with, to leave you with, fighting this information and correcting errors, errors, is like bringing a knife to a gunfight. The real fight are influence operations where disinformation is one small element of it. People have been sensibilized about it, um, worried about it, are aware that there are lies out there on the internet. Other tricks are being used for the same mission. And with that, I would conclude. Thank you.